Well, good morning. That's not Rocky. It's not even a family member, but I'd let them adopt me. All right, my name is Andal Nader, and you have to give me a second to get situated because I have to put the readers on and get my little space organized. All right. Again, my name is Andal, and my family and I have been attending the bridge for five and a half years now. And if you've attended for any time, you know that Pastor Rocky always says that everybody needs a My Church. Well, guess what? This is my My Church. <laughs> Through the years of attending here, I can confidently say that I've only become more passionate about being salt and light in this world and teaching others about Jesus. And I am so very happy to be bringing you a message about prayer today and honored that I was asked to do so. I am a part of the prayer team here at the bridge. I also often lead women connect groups. And so when I was asked to give a message on prayer, I was elated. I'm a little nervous, but elated. All right, before we go to the message today, let's take a moment and go to prayer. Father God, I give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are. Father, I ask that you are with us during this message today. Give us clarity and a willingness to receive what you would have us to hear, Father. Let today's message be the words you give and ordain. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start today with our theme verse from our current series on prayer, found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus. You know, the past two weeks, we've heard dynamic messages from Pastor Joel and Pastor Rocky about the foundation of prayer and that prayer can simply just be a conversation between you and your Heavenly Father. Today, we're going to continue learning about prayer, specifically the disposition of prayer. Now, the last two weeks, both Pastor Joel and Pastor Rocky mentioned the word disposition. But in order for us to get a full understanding of the disposition of prayer, we need to know exactly what a disposition is. So, what is a disposition? It's a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. It's a prevailing tendency, mood, or inclination. It's a temperamental makeup. It's the tendency of someone to act in a certain manner, under a given set of circumstances. Someone's disposition is their mood or their great attitude about life. It simply means that you have a positive or negative way of viewing the world. Now, after hearing all those descriptors, if I would ask you what are some of the prevailing dispositions of your spouse, your best friend, your parents, could you give me an answer? Of course you could. You not only live and spend time with them, you live with their dispositions. For instance, after 32 years of marriage, I know the many dispositions of Steve Nader. Let me give some examples. Every morning, Steve wakes up in a good mood and begins whistling. Insert eye roll emoji here. He generally every day has a truly happy disposition when he wakes up. However, his disposition will change if his golf shot doesn't go where he wants it to go. I know and can predict that man's many dispositions. Guess what? He knows my many dispositions too. For instance, I do not whistle in the mornings. 
I grunt. But my disposition takes a turn for the better if somebody tells me I have a block of time that I can sit down and read a good book. All of us have a wide range of dispositions. You know what's really interesting? God knows all of our varied dispositions. He created us. He knows where we are temperamental, and he knows our tendencies. He knows our heart. Thank goodness God provides guidance in his word on what a right disposition of the heart looks like. You see, when God wants something from us or wants us to embrace his methods, he always equips us. So if we wonder what a disposition of prayer should look like, feel like, God's word gives us that very guidance. So let's look at a godly example. Let's look in the Bible at one of the most fervent prayers ever prayed, and it was prayed by King David. It was found, it is found in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, King David was described as a man after God's own heart. That's a disposition we should all strive for. But what did it mean that David was a man after God's own heart? Well, it meant several things. First thing, he believed in God from his youth. He believed Second thing, he diligently and continually sought God's face and counsel in childlike dependence. How else could he pick up that slingshot and that rock and launch it to the giant Goliath? He knew God had his back. He worshiped God with his whole being and directed all of Israel to do the same. He humbly recognized God that God was the real king, and he was just his representative. In his public conduct, he largely obeyed the Lord and carried out his will. Now, I don't know if you noticed the verbs in those descriptors. Believed, sought, worshipped, recognized, obeyed. When David did those things, He had the right disposition. It was one that actually mirrored God the Father. Now, let's be real. There were times in David's life that these areas weren't his disposition at all. In fact, adultery and murder were also part of David's history. But I would venture to guess that it was more enjoyable to be around David when his dispositions reflected the God Almighty's nature versus when David was steeped in sin. So let's concentrate on the positive example of David. Let's look at the example of that sincere prayer he gave. David said, search me. God, any sin, offensive thought, or attitude, reveal them to me so that I can repent and change them. He said, God, know my heart. Father, I want you to know me better than I know myself. Test me, Lord. Know my anxious thoughts. David's saying, Lord, I know you already know them anyway. But true spiritual power comes from handing those anxious thoughts over. One of my favorite phrases, and I've used it before, that Pastor Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands uses is that, Problems can't be ours and God's at the same time. Hand those worries and anxieties over. David said to the Lord, point out to me, Father, anything that offends you. Anything that's in me that offends you. And finally, he said, lead me. Lead me in a pure life so that I can be closer to you, Father. That very prayer that David prayed should be our prayer. Search me, God. Show me where I'm sinning. Adjust my attitude. Guide my thought life. 
Father, know my heart. Purify my motives. Sanctify me and make me righteous through your son, Jesus Christ. You know, the right disposition of our heart should be one of transparency and sincere repentance. David invited God into his innermost thoughts and asked God to alter his perspective to see things as God sees them. We should ask God to reveal sins we are committing that we have normalized in our lives to the point that we don't even identify them anymore. We should have such a relationship with our Father that we invite him to know us inside and out. Let me give you a personal example, speaking of normalizing sin. For years, I did that, just that. I normalized sin in my life by continuously overeating. It was an easily hidden addiction. Everybody's got to eat, right? It took too long, but with God's grace, I realized that every time I was overeating, I wasn't treating my body as the, God, as the vessel God created it to be. It was sin in my life. I had an idol, and that idol was food. Every time I was overindulging, I was changing the very disposition and nature of who God created me to be. I needed God to search me. I needed him to know me, to test me, to point it out to me, and lead me to, to deliverance in this area. Hey, it takes courage to pray a Psalm 139 prayer. But it also gives the Lord permission to continue his work inside of us. I don't know about you, but I like my disposition better, and I bet my family likes my disposition better when God's in charge of it. I want to develop the lifestyle of Jesus as much as possible. I want to give God permission to become detail-oriented in my life. So even though it can hurt a little and be very difficult, I personally will barrel through a Psalm 139 prayer as often as I need to. At this moment, some of you are thinking, Andal, I'm not you. I can't barrel through prayer. I can't barrel through anything. And at the same time, some of you are thinking thoughts like, I do want my disposition to be more godly. I want a good, pure, gentle, self-sacrificing, noble disposition. But I don't know how to get it. Well, friends, it takes practice, specifically prayer practice. So speaking of practice, <laughs> when I was a little girl, I was a little on the chubby side, and my mom decided, you know, it's going to be great, and we're gonna, you're going to take some tap lessons. Now, she probably had the intention, let's do anything to get that girl moving, okay? Maybe she'll become a little less chubby. I can still remember my first tap lesson with Mrs. Joe Donna Day. I was nine or ten, and my mom had bought all the requisite materials for tap dancing. I had the black leotard, the black tights, the shiny black tap shoes, and oh, they made a great noise. I looked the part. But as you soon find out, I couldn't play the part. The class began, and Miss Jo Donna, she showed us what true tap dancing could look like. She glided across the floor. She made it look effortless. She was showing us a move called shuffle ball change. I thought it was magical. Then Miss Jo Donna asked the participants to try their own shuffle ball change. Well, that's when things became a lot less magical for me. I was completely devastated that I couldn't immediately tap dance like Miss Jodana. I attempted a shuffle ball change, but it came out more like a scuffle ball plop. My disposition changed from an excited little girl to a downtrodden, overwhelmed Tears in her eyes, lump of sadness. Well, as adults, we all know that my inability to immediately be able to mirror her tap dancing 
and do it in an efficient and graceful manner was unrealistic. And since then, I've heard the statistic, and I think Lindsay Cobble shared the same statistic on a Wednesday night. It takes 10,000 hours to master something. Well, I was given up in 15 minutes. Friends, our prayer life is no different. It takes practice, too. When I became a Christian as a young girl, I obviously didn't know how to press into prayer like I do now. I needed practice. As a result, I've read books on prayer. I use specific tools for prayer to this day. I have prayer books, 31 prayers for my son, 31 prayers for my daughters, 12,050 prayers for my husband. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. That one says 31 also. I use tools. The Pray First app and book that we use during 21 days of prayer, I made that a regular part of my prayer life. And by the way, I can't let this go by without saying it. It is a very true statement for me to say that the August and January weeks of 21 days of prayer have changed my life. You know, in August, it falls during the start of school. And for me, I'm an educator, and so that's always full of new beginnings. And and back when I started the 21 days of prayer, it was kind of eye-opening to me that I could carry that same attitude into the school I'm at. And so every August, before the first day of school, I walk into every classroom, I sit at every teacher's desk, And I run my hands over every student's desk. And I pray for God's anointing in those classrooms. I pray that learning will take place. I pray that they feel the Spirit of God every time they walk our halls. That was an idea I got from 21 Days of Prayer. When we do it in January, it's the start of a new calendar year, new beginnings. I am telling you the 6 a.m. sacrifice And I'm weird. I get up at 4 a.m. because it takes two hours to create this. (laughs) It's worth it. It is so worth it. Well, as I said, I need tools to help me pray. Now, today, I told you I'm an educator. The teacher's going to come out in me. I would like to give you a very practical tool that you could use for prayer And it may be something that you don't shuffle ball change right away. You may shuffle plop, but it may be a strategy that you can use. So as I mentioned, I'm an educator. I'm starting my 30th year. I'm a teacher by heart and by trade. In fact, nothing fills my heart more than I have two former students that are a part of the bridge. That's Mari Carter, that often she is on this stage singing and proclaiming God's love from, from her voice. And then I had well, taught Cheyenne Rusher, who was serving as a youth leader. There's nothing better for a teacher to see, for me to see, that the children I spent time with are now serving the Lord with gusto. But anyway, when I taught junior high students, or what I lovingly and very respectfully refer to as zits, armpits, and hormones, lovingly, I found that my students were most successful when my lesson plans had a very practical application. So I want to share to you, with you today, my captive audience right now, a practical application of prayer that made a tremendous difference in my personal prayer life. It's not profound. It's not difficult. It's a tool. It's simply this. Repeat God's words back to him. That's it. We often get caught up in not knowing what to pray or how to pray, and at times I'm certainly no different. In the moments that words aren't coming to me or flowing out of me in prayer, I often pick up my Bible and I speak the living word out loud into the atmosphere. 
I believe there is supernatural power when someone actually speaks God's name or his word out loud. By praying scripture, you are reminding God of his words and his promises, and he loves that. When I start praying, I always start with a time of acknowledging and praising God for who he is. But some days I need help even getting started with that. On those days, I'll pick up my Bible and I'll flip through to the Psalms. And I'll just choose one to pray out loud. And if you would allow me to, I'd like to just model that for you. So Psalm 34, verse 1 says this. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. So my prayer might be something like this. Father, I lift your name up on high. Father, there's no one that deserves to be extolled more than you. And Father, may every word that comes out of my mouth today be a praise unto who you are. Verse 2. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Father, today, if I am bragging on anything, let it be your presence, the capabilities that you create in me, and let the people around me see you through me, and let it be a moment of rejoicing. Verse 3, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Father, you're the Alpha, the Omega, beginning, in Lord of Lords. You are my banner. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're my provider. And I go on and on praising the different names of God. Verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Thank you, Father, that you're such a good God that you actually answer. Thank you, Father, that you deliver me from every fear that may come against me. Verse 5. Those that look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Father, I thank you that your presence inside me, the Holy Spirit inside me, causes your joy to radiate out from me. And Father, may I always give you the glory from that joy. Let people see my face and know whew, God's hands upon her. And Father, may I never be covered in shame. Thank you, Lord that you have taken the shame of my past and you have peeled it back layer by layer so that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Thank you, Lord, that all I have to do is say the name of Jesus. Even when I can't come up with the words, if I say the name of Jesus, Father, you will rescue me from my troubles. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he deliver his, delivers them. Father, I thank you right now that even as we're in this church service, your angels are encamping around this building. Father, you are so good to us. You even say that angels will keep us from bumping our toe on a rock. I thank you that you provide that protection for your children. And the last one, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Father, may my first instinct always be to take refuge in you. May I not listen to the world and what society would tell me, Father, but instead hear your voice. All right, you get the idea. When we don't know what or how to pray, we can simply rely on the words that God's already given us. The word is divine. It is God-breathed. It is alive. Why wouldn't we use it in our prayer life? What's also incredible about speaking God's words back to him is that it increases our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Pastor Rocky mentioned that verse last week. This strategy of repeating God's words back to him not only can create momentum in your prayer life, it builds your faith. Now, let me emphasize, there is no one right formula for prayer that you have to follow. This is simply a tool you can use. 
And I also get that there are scriptures in the Bible that would be very uncomfortable to pray, and this strategy wouldn't be the best to use. Because I like humor, let me give you an example. For instance, there's a verse in 2 Chronicles that says, God smites women, children, and often animals with equal gusto. In verse 14, it says, Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wives and all thy goods, and thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. This is not one I'm going to proclaim or repeat. <laughs> we must use common sense and remember prayers about our hearts. It's not about whether you're kneeling, folding your hands, or even where you are. In fact, during the first week of 21 days of prayer, I hopped out of my vehicle one morning, and I'd already been talking to the Lord on the way here, and I stepped, put my foot on the parking lot right out there, and I, I heard this audible voice speaking to me and right there in the parking lot, and I was just in awe. I couldn't believe that God was being so demonstrative in conversation with me and allowing, him to, allowing me to hear his audible voice. And then it hit me. It wasn't God at all. It was a good old boy ordering a blueberry biscuit from the Hardee's drive-thru right back there. You win some and you lose some. In all seriousness, as Rocky reminded us last week, prayer is about a conversation with God, and that helps develop your heart's disposition. Prayer itself is not a disposition, but instead it's the very condition in which our lives can drastically be changed. It is through prayer that spiritual mountains are moved. It is through prayer that burdens are lifted. It is through prayer that strongholds are broken. It is through prayer that our hearts and our dispositions become more like Jesus. Popular speaker and author John Maxwell says this, Conversation and collaboration will always come up with better answers than isolation and exclusion. While John Maxwell is known worldwide as a person who trains leaders to be the best leaders they can be, he's also a pastor. He isn't just talking about successful business models or leadership styles. He's also referring to the relationship between us and our Heavenly Father. We shouldn't exclude him or deny him access to our lives. Not if we want better answers. Besides, if we want the greatest benefits available in life, then we absolutely need God to lead us. You know, looking at that quote, the words isolation and exclusion jumped out to me. You know why? Because working with women, I sometimes know that we are guilty of isolating ourselves. And when we isolate ourselves, it's not good. I want to take a moment to encourage you to be a part of inclusion. Um, coming up in September on the 13th and 14th, we're having a women's conference, and it's called the Radiant Conference. And it's a Friday night out with women and a Saturday morning time of learning and prayer. If you're a woman out there and you've been excluding yourself, isolating yourself, that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. Put yourself out there. Come to events like this so that, just like that quote said, not only can you get better answers, you can be loved on. All right. There is no one better for us to have a conversation with or collaborate, collaborate with than the one who created us and knows us inside and out. We need to be like David. We need to believe, search, worship, recognize, and obey. When we do, our dispositions will forever be changed. And prayer won't be a mundane task that we check off every day or once a week. It won't be artificial and empty. 
instead and I've experienced this in my own life, it'll be a, like a gravitational force that draws us to spend more and more time with our Heavenly Father. Your heart cry today should be, I want to be a man or woman after God's own heart. I want to live a life where prayer is not just a disposition in which I'm on my knees with my hands folded and I look angelic. But instead, my prayer life changes the very disposition and nature of who I am and who I'm still becoming in Christ Jesus. Ask God to increase your desire to spend time with him. Ask God to know you and search you. Ask God to reveal that which has been hidden. Do all these askings in a time of simple conversation or even by repeating the very words God has already spoken to us. Now, as we come to the closing part of our service, Mr. Michael Rusher is going to come up and help us get in that very disposition of prayer. In this moment, as he comes to the stage, please put aside all that distracts you for just a few moments. Put your focus on God the Father. Allow divine conversation to connect you like it never has before. Expect intimate engagement with him. Ask to hear his voice. Ask for close fellowship with him. Yearn for full dependence on God. Thanks for listening to today's message. We pray that it strengthened, encouraged, and empowered you. We would love to connect with you. So if you have questions, need prayer, or simply want to let us know how this message has helped you, please send an email to info at To stay up to date with all the events at The Bridge, follow us on Facebook and Instagram.